So grass is everywhere. It is in your garden lawn. It's in your food. Rice is a grass. Sweet corn is a grass. And it's in your glass of beer. It's a grass as well. Cows and sheep are predators of grass. And plants can't run away from them. So lots of plants have actually evolved defenses to defend themselves against these fearsome animals that eat grass. Now, you might think that grass is a pretty innocent plant. You mow your lawn, it grows back. But grasses have actually evolved a secret anti-herbivore defense. And I'm going to tell you about that. Over the centuries, going back at least 2,000 years, farmers and naturalists observed periodically mysterious deaths of animals like horses. Suddenly, they'd all just keel over and die in a perfectly normal-looking field, like your back lawn. But it wasn't until 35 years ago that scientists discovered what was killing these animals. Has anyone heard of this kind of stuff? No, this is news to all of you. Fantastic. Okay. So grasses don't have thorns and spines. What they did was they phoned a friend. And in this case, it was a fungus. And this is a fungus that is completely invisible. It never pokes its head outside of its host grass plant. And that was why it took so long, honestly, for it to be discovered as the cause of all these mysterious deaths that would happen in these perfectly normal fields. The fungus that is living inside these grasses has evolved. Its ancestor is a, a disease-causing grass, which is quite famous, ergot of rye. Um, lots of people might have heard of that, which makes people who eat the bread made from contaminated flour do funny things, including maybe imagine they're a witch or something like that. Um, and what the fungus does is it synthesizes or makes neurotoxins, which if the levels are high enough, it'll kill the animals, but if they're quite low, it'll just make them stagger around. And these are neurotoxins, and they are related to the hallucinogenic LSD. So if you've ever heard of LSD, same kind of thing, and the animals are eating it. So I want to turn to this remote place called St. Kilda. You can see it on the top left. It is the remotest place in Britain. It's the wettest and windiest part of Britain. And there are a lot of grasses. You can see here lots of grasses on St. Kilda. It's also a UNESCO World Heritage Site for its amazing seabird colonies and its fantastic um, cultural history and archaeology. You can see some abandoned houses here. And in 1930, the St. Kildans asked to be evacuated because they were really fed up of living on seabirds and seabird eggs. They had to keep climbing down those cliffs, often falling into the ocean. It was really a very grim kind of lifestyle. So they were evacuated to the mainland, and that's another whole story you can explore. And the owner of this group of islands, St. Kilda is actually an archipelago of several islands and some stacks where the seabirds are living. What the owner did was he brought small brown feral soe sheep from the island of Soe over here onto the biggest island, Herta, and he just let them go to do whatever they wanted. Uh, the St. Kildans actually took their little white sheep with them under their arms as they left. They took them to the mainland. And what happened was that the Population grew and naturalists who kept going back to the islands noticed that after about 10 years, uh, the population plateaued and every few years there would be a massive population crash and about half the animals would die. So St. Kilda soe sheep have actually, in their feral, there's no, there's no predator, nothing's eating them, and they're the, one of the best studied populations of animals in the world on this natural laboratory of this island. And many of my colleagues and previous scientists have asked the question, what's killing the sheep? What's regulating the population? Uh, their parasites and illnesses have been studied, their genetics have been studied, their demography has been studied, and 30 years ago, I got to go and study the grasses that they were eating. So what's actually going on? Well, the first thing that we discovered was that, if you see on the top right, that's red fescue grass. You've probably got it in your lawn, and we checked 
a lot of the grasses and indeed on the main island where the sheep were grazing most of the grasses had this invisible fungus in it that you could only see with a microscope on a neighboring island which didn't have any sheep but which had big black slugs so not very much grazing hardly any of the grasses had the fungus so the fungus is acting as a herbivore defense. It's producing toxins. So you're all probably sitting there thinking, why aren't all the sheep dead? If the grass is poisonous, why aren't they dead? Well, what's going on is that the level of poison is varying depending on the number of sheep. So the more the grass is grazed, the more alkaloid is being produced. So when there's not very many sheep, the poison levels drop. And this seems to be one of the factors, along with the parasites, it's it, lots of different reasons the animals are dying. So if you're a sheep on St. Kilda, the good news is your spit actually detoxifies the fungus. If you pull the fungus out and you drop uh, reindeer or moose or cow spit onto the fungus, it slows it down. But what I'm going to tell you is don't lick the grass because human saliva doesn't slow down the growth of the fungus. So to wrap up, we've, and that's more recent research, I've been studying this for 30 years. What I would say is over the decades, um, we've actually thrown up more questions than we've answered about this very strange interaction between a grass, a sheep, and the fungus that lives in the grass. And the main thing that we've really battled over the decades is that this is such new research that the methods that have allowed us to answer the questions simply weren't there. We've had to develop a lot of the methods and uh, as have other colleagues. And in fact, I'll end by saying that in my lab today, we're still having to develop methods to figure out what's going on. And our latest method involves brine shrimp, sea monkeys. I have a question for you. Do the toxins build up in the cattle or sheep? And when humans eat it, do they get affected? Oh my God, everyone asks me that question. <laughs> everyone. Asks. So we've actually studied this in the Northwest Territories um, uh, because the further north you go in the Arctic towards the poles, uh, you've got this, this, this grass and it's hosting its defensive organism. Uh, but the further north you go, the, the harsher the environment. So actually, the grasses can't afford to have a fungus living inside them, so they tend to lose them. So when we were talking about this with um, Inuit elders in the Arctic, that was the first question they asked us because we had tracked that the, the grasses were moving north with um, uh, roadside um, uh, verges were being planted with fescue seeds brought from Alberta which were full of the fungus and what I can say is no so that those toxins do not accumulate in the animal but they do have a really drastic effect on things like milk production in cows so they won't kill the cows but they really slow them down and there are a lot of sublethal effects but but you won't die from eating them it's okay you should not be worried, and I'll tell you the most amazing thing uh, is probably, this is speculated upon by archaeologists and historians. Um, so, how does the fungus get to a daughter plant? It, it, it is always alive. It grows into the seed as a live hypha, you know, like that moldy stuff on your bread mold, right? It never has a dormant phase. So what is happening is that seeds of grasses that have this fungal endophyte, and it's a lot of grass species have it, they drop onto the ground, they germinate, and then the fungus will grow into the seedling daughter plant, right? Because it grows up into the seed without killing the seed. Now, it has been speculated that human agriculture was basically caused by people short-circuiting the natural defense of all these grains and grasses. Because what they did was they stored the grain. And you can actually store grain. If you store it long enough, the fungus will die, but the seed will still germinate. So don't worry. And the good news is for ryegrass, which has this black ergot of um, a fungus, which actually is, is, is a disease. It is a choke. It, like, it, it completely takes over the seed. There's very careful screening of the contamination levels of ergot. So all that crazy stuff, that was like medieval times. You're okay.
It's like super, super um, micro levels uh, are bioactive of these neurotoxins. Yeah, and thank you, fungus, for all that wonderful medicine. Did you ever lick any of the grass? Okay, did I ever, here's the question, did I ever lick any of the grass? No, but when we were doing uh, all this research where we would extract the fungus and grow it on a petri plate, and you have these little fungal colonies, um, we were testing um, spit from as many different animals as we could get. So I have donated spit to be dropped onto fungus colonies. So we had spit tubes and we were getting them from dogs, uh, fun uh, spit from dogs. We got cows. Um, and how do you get spit, you might wonder, to you basically ask a really nice vet um, to as the animal, as, a, as an animal is under sedation, to just collect up the drool. Because you know when you're, in, okay, so when you go to the dentist, you know they put that thing in your mouth when they're, yeah, because you're always salivating, it turns out. These guys are worried now, they're like, oh. <laughs> like, and, and you know what, when you talk about salivating, you're all now conscious that you're salivating, right? Are you all like <laughs> thinking about like, oh my God, I'm salivating. It never turns off. Um, so I'm wondering, does the endophyte cr make the grass more bitter so that the sheep or ah, the cattle... Does the endophyte make it? the grass taste different? Yeah. We actually took a whole bunch of grass from Scotland to Toronto to Utah to do trials with the world's expert on diet selection in sheep, Fred Provenza. He's, got an, he's retired. There's an amazing new book out called Nourishment. And the answer is yes, they can tell the difference. You actually, what you do is you do this um, like a behavior test where you pair things with an emetic that makes them vomit. <laughs> and <laughs> sorry, sorry, but I'm sorry. This is going downhill really fast. Um, and, and then you can tell, then you offer them different infected. So the grass, you can clear the fungus out of the grass um, by just storing it or exposing it to a fungicide. And sheep can tell the difference. But when you're on an island, you're going to eat that grass, whether it's going to kill you or not, right? I'm worried about nefarious um, motivation, and I'm wondering whether you or any of your colleagues have been contacted by people who want to do animal culls. Animal culls. Culls. Um, for sheep, no. Um, you mean like on St. Kilda? No, any, no, anywhere. I mean, anywhere, like, instead of having a rabbit-proof fence, uh, could you uh. get rid of the rabbits by transferring this oh oh yeah re that's re that's actually so is there a, um, a, a commercial use for this technology interestingly you may have gone to buy a uh, fescue grass for your lawn and you might have seen that it says it's got a fungus in it this endophyte because that will actually reduce the, the amount of insect attack and damage on your lawn. So it, it was marketed, I don't know if that's still a thing, but it was being marketed in gardening centers as something that was naturally resistant to like, uh, I don't know, like Japanese beetles or something that would eat the grass. Yeah. So we, I, I, um, that was more in the 90s and 2000s, but, but no. In fact, in, um, in Kentucky, where this, uh, so what actually happened in the States, it was a real disaster, was they planted this amazing range grass called tall fescue, which grew really vigorous and it was drought resistant. And the farmers were like, oh, this is this amazing grass. They spread it everywhere. And guess what? Uh, it killed all their cattle because it had a fungal endophyte in it, which was the symbiont, which was defending it. And so that's partly why we can do so much research because so much vet testing was developed really fast and the farmers will dig up their fields every three years. They, they monitor the, the level of toxicity. Uh, it's become is a huge problem actually in Kentucky, all those places. Mm. Thank you so much, Dawn. This is amazing. Thank you.